So good morning. I'm very happy to see so many of you still here after long week, short nights. So <clears throat> today we uh, start by discussing uh, barrier genesis. And now I first I go through some kind of standard stuff a bit, uh, some main points, and then we then we I can slow down and 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 do something in a bit more detail. So. Now, any discussion of baryogenesis usually starts with the Sak Sakharov conditions. And now I will not even list all of them and discuss whether and why and why not they are satisfied. Um, I, I probably most of you have heard this many times. I will, we will focus on one of them which is the barrier number violation. And so the starting point is that in the standard model, then uh, barrier number, well actually barrier plus lepton number is uh, violated by um, the chiral anomaly. And so, so I will now write an equation. So this is a divergence of a current where one sums over the, these are generations. And then quarks and leptons so quark part is then b and the lepton part is the lepton number and so this is then equal to three well the three is the same as the number of generations here and then some factors 32 pi squared epsilon mu nu rho sigma and then two terms one is from the rho sigma so it's always with the epsilon tensor so these are these topological terms this one is from the weak gauge group so as you left two and then there's minus from the hypercharge Okay, so now if one, <coughs> if one then integrates this equation from let's say T1 to T2 in time and over T3x over the volume, then on the left hand side this is a divergence and so if we integrate we get the delta, delta B plus L and then on the right hand side, well, this is not obviously a divergence, but may probably m many of you know that actually it is a divergence and we'll, we'll show that later on for the uh, abelian part. So now I just said it's also a divergence and, and, and when, when one then integrates it over space and over time, then, well, there may be some factors, so let me write the proportionality, but out comes a delta of something else, which we call the Chern-Simons number and two, I mean to the SU2 minus churn Simons of S1. So somehow then we see that the barium plus lepton is violated by some changes in topology. These are these fancy things. Okay, so now the rate of, of this violation, which I denote by gamma B plus L, is usually then referred to as the Sveleron rate. Well, in particular, if we talk about it at finite temperature. And, and now the picture is that we, we usually draw this kind of a picture that we, 
it is then said that if one kind of draws some sort of an effective potential as in the sense we had it, but now it's, it's not an effective potential for the Higgs field, but it's an effective potential rather in the space of the gauge fields. And we draw it as a function of the topologic of this churn simons number, in particular related to the non abelian group, then, then there is there, there's a non-trivial structure. Um, there are vacua, and then in between the vacua there are barriers. And now processes which, which then change Baryon plus Nepton number are processes which change also the churn simons number according to this equation. Okay, so now that when, when, once you draw this, now, now of course we ha I haven't explained why it looks like that, but this is a brief summary what one believes. So once one draws this, one, one then uh, we then that actually there, well, the determination of this rate, it's very similar to what we discussed in the nucleation rate. Again, we have some vacua and, and the question is how far, fast do we go to the other vacua? How fast do we change? And so again, it could happen via vacuum tunneling, it could happen via thermal tunneling and all these cases that we discussed before. So in fact, um, we then think that if we are at zero temperature, then it's vacuum tunneling via instantons and in that situation the rate exists but it's extremely small 8 pi squared over the weak coupling squared and the weak coupling is less than 1 so this is a large number so, so this is very very small and so that's why it's fine, because of course we've never observed any reaction which violates baryon plus lepton number. This says that in the standard model it, exist, it exists, the rate is non-zero, but it's just so small that it's not observable. Okay, if we then increase temperature, and now I immediately increase the temperature sort of, uh, well, not only a little bit, but like macroscopically, but still I stay below the electroweak phase transition. So finite temperature. Then we have this thermal fluctuations via sphalerons. And these are not now, so to say, the sphalerons proper. This is the context in which these sphalerons were really introduced. And so in, as we, as we di discussed with the nucleation, in this situation, the action is it looks like a classical Boltzmann action. So, so there is one over T somehow. There must be one over T there. And in fact, it looks like th this is eight pi MW, G W squared times T in some limit. And then there is a function, function which depends on the scalar self-coupling. And normally we say scalar self-coupling depends on the Higgs mass. So it kind of depends on the ratio of the Higgs mass uh, to the W mass, but this function is, is, is of order unity and slowly varying and numerically determined. Okay, so, so there is now a rate and in some sense, well, it is larger than this vacuum rate because if you imagine that you make temperature large, then the exponential suppression becomes smaller. T becomes large, M over W becomes smaller. Suppression is smaller. But still, this is a small, it's still at an exponentially suppressed rate. And so, in fact, we, uh, we believe, we like to think of a phase transition where we are in a situation that this is still smaller, so gamma, B plus L is still less than the Hubble rate. In other words, um, these processes are not in 
equilibrium. They take place in principle, but they take place so slowly that in practice they don't they, they don't play, take place. They don't establish equilibrium. Then when we go to temperatures larger than Tc, what happens is that, well, the, then the symmetry gets restored in, in, in some sense. In perturbation theory, we say that the Higgs vacuum expectation value is zero. Well, this means that the MW is zero. Well, this means that all of a sudden we don't have any exponential suppression here. It's just one. So the rate is not zero, it's large. The exponential suppression vanishes. And there's a large body of work then to, in that case, if the exponential is not there, then you have to be careful about the prefactor. And, and people have, have worked on that quite a bit. And, and one then found out that in that situation, there is some suppression by There is some suppression by couplings, so fi weak fine structure constant to the power fifth times t and modulo some logs or so. So it looks like it's suppressed, but now if we compare this to the Hubble rate, it's still large because in the Hubble rate there is a suppression by the Planck mass. And so in fact this rate is, is in equilibrium for well, from Tc up to something like 10 to 10 GeV. Okay, so now this, this then gives us this kind of sets the stage for the, well, the idea of, of electroweak variogenesis. is that as long as we are above Tc, then, uh, well, the rate is fast, is in equilibrium, and if it's in equilibrium, then you violate B plus L. That means if you put there any B plus L, then it dissipates away. This is this dissipation that we saw. You go to equilibrium, but in the equilibrium, the value is zero. That's the only value which doesn't change, even if you, if you have these processes. Anything else would go towards the equilibrium. T, t plus t, t larger than Tc in equilibrium and so B plus L would be zero. Now, if you are then at Tc and you have some funny dynamics as we've seen, then maybe we generate B plus L not equal to zero. And then when immediately when you are below Tc, then this exponential suppression takes over and we are not in equilibrium and therefore what we generated stays there. We say that there's no washout. And so that, that might then work. Now, of course, there are... So wake up. Wake up. Can you m mute somebody else? Now I think there was a self-mute, so I guess it's okay. I think it's now it's all muted, so it should be okay. Yes, so I'm, the, the hard, hard work here is in the middle stage and that, that one then should work out and that's so for sure we will not do. Okay, so that, that much for the basic picture. Now, now I want to do, now do something. Uh, well, the um, you 
you know, this is kind of important politics, and it's a bit um, unpleasant if one has to rely on all these fancy stories from 30 years to, to even understand that it's possible in principle. So at least some of these things we should be, somehow should, uh, we should be able to see it in a kind of more concrete terms. And so, so and indeed there is a way to, to s at least understand something in a, in a nice way. And it goes like this. So, so the question is, can we, can we understand something about about the, let's say, B plus L anomaly in a simple way. Now the simple, yes, the answer is yes, and the, si the simple way is uh, somehow quantum filter is really ro robust and strong enough that if you try to do something wrong, then then usually it tells you that you are doing something wrong if you if you look at the right thing, and so what we do is now um, now bravely just kind of ignore what we what we have learned, and and just assume that baryon number and lepton number say are separately conserved. I mean we know that they shouldn't be, no, but let's let's say that we don't know that. Let's just assume they are conserved. So. Just assume that all, well, that many, well, in principle all, but I will select some, all um, um, fermion numbers are conserved. And so the question is then what, what, what could go wrong? So what, how, how do I do this? Well, if I assume that all fermion numbers are conserved, then what I can do is I can assign chemical potentials to them. And so that's what I will do. I'll, I'll say that mu q is a chemical potential for quarks. And for leptons, I also take chemical potentials, and there I even take separate chemical potentials for all generations, because for leptons we se separately talk about electron, muon, and tau, so k is one to three electron, muon, tau, and I separately take them from, for left-handed leptons and for right-handed leptons. So how, how do we do it? Well, so this means that we kind of, on the, in quantum mechanics, this would say that I would replace the Hamiltonian by Hamiltonian minus then mu q times the quark number. So let's say n for quarks minus uh, sum of k, one to three, k l n for left-handed leptons and KR number density of right-handed leptons. And so quite concretely then on the Lagrangian level it means that, that I, I would take say L, I'll take, I'll take the Euc Euclidean Lagrangian now uh, and so there is a term for instance some fermion psi bar gamma mu d mu psi so if it's a lepton, I would first put here, I would separate it into left and right modes by inserting there a unit operator. So then it would be psi, uh, psi left, gamma mu, d 
EMU Psi left. And the right, and then I insert these chemical potentials. And so what, what it means is then that I add there a term which is then minus, and in the number density there's gamma zero, minus gamma zero mu L for the left handed psi L, and similarly for the right handed. And then if I did it in momentum space, What would happen is one sees now in momentum space, if I take the time derivative here, that's what, what is changing, the zero component. So in momentum space, I would have, from the derivative, I would have gamma zero times then my, my Matsubara frequency, I omega n. And then that would be modified by the mu L. And so this means that I would have gamma zero I I can write it as omega n plus i mu l. So in this Matsubara formalism, what the temperature appears in the Matsubara frequencies, they're discrete, and then the chemical potentials appear that the, these frequencies are shifted by some um, imaginary amount. But, but the structure doesn't change, so the propagators look exactly the same, Feynman rules are exactly the same. The only thing is that for the frequencies, for the energies, you have to have discrete frequencies and shift them with the chemical potential. Okay, so, so it's a simple change. So we can easily do this. And what, what do we want to then do with that? We now modify the Feynman rules by introducing these chemical potentials. What could we do, do with that? Well, for instance, we can what we can do is we can rederive the theory which we already discussed, this dimensionally reduced theory with a modified propagators. So this means that we would take diagrams where we have, for instance, a gauge field from the covariant derivative and then some fermion loop. And now we recompute that. Actually, we should start even with a funny looking diagram with a single uh, gauge field, but then also two gauge fields, and so forth. And we, we recompute that. And why is it important to recompute them? It's because key point is that this chemical potential, well, it, it, it tells you that there's a net number density. So it makes a distinction between particles and antiparticles. And so the technical way to say it is that mu's break charge conjugation. So they break a symmetry. And now if you break a symmetry, you can get, can get new operators. Which you didn't have when, you, when the symmetry was present. So computing this kind of graphs is, is, is not complicated. With this modif simple modification of the Feynman rules, we could, we could do it, but we, we won't do it. Instead, I will, I will write what, what happens. So let me first write what we had already before. There was the weak gauge group, the hypercharge, then we had the Higgs Okay, that's what we had before. 
Now then, there are some terms which I will not write here, but in the notes there are some further terms. In particular, there are terms with, which have the zero, terms with a zero, a, and b zero. And one could, if one had time, one could discuss a little bit why, why they may be there, may be kept, or may not be kept. But actually, for us, they are not important. Important is that then, then the following two terms, very important. First of all, there's a term like this. Okay, I write it like this. Uh, three times three uh, is nine, but I did like three times three mu q. Well, I write it like this because often people use, they call three times mu q, they call that the baryon chemical potential, mu b. Three times the quark. Plus some k one to three. And here come the left-handed lepton chemical potentials. Okay, so now you see it's a term proportional to the chemical potential. So without the chemical potential, it would not be there. So it's really because you you break the break some symmetry. And what appear, appear, appears here is the, and I define this in a moment. So n churn Simons two minus n churn Simons one. Plus, and there's another term, two times one to three. And here I have the difference of left-handed minus right-handed lepton chemical potentials. And in that case, there's only the churn simons one. And so here, this n, let's start with the one. So that is G1, the hypercharge coupling divided by 32 pi squared, epsilon i, j, k, p, i, f, j, k, where f, j, k is is the usual field strength co corresponding to the hy hypercharge. And so this is the, like the churn simons density, the, what, what we had before the capital churn simons number, which is then, yeah, which, which is really like a yeah, dimensionless, dimensionless number, so could be integer, in, the, in particular in the non-abelian case, it's, it's the integral of this density. And for the, uh, for the non-abelian case, it starts the same way with a weak coupling. And then of course the non-abelian uh, potentials and uh, Field strength, and then there's another term in the non-abelian case with uh, F, A, B, C, the structure constants, and A, B, C, I, J, K. Okay, so these kind of terms s appear to be generated. And so now what I, what I will uh, claim is that well now we have done really like a very simple-minded computation derived this theory. We get this term and what I claim is that these terms lead to instabilities the system is not stable if you perturb it 
it goes crazy. Starts, something starts growing exponentially. So therefore, the assumption, the simple-minded assumption we ma made that let's just, let's just go ahead, let's ignore anything, everything, and, and, and just compute, it must be wrong. These terms, the assumption that independent chemical potentials can be assigned is is simply invalid is wrong and now in particular it means that in the real world these coefficients they must be zero <laughs> i mean they, we made this assumption we can compute them and we get these terms but these terms lead to instability so they, they must not be there in equilibrium so therefore the coefficients must be zero and so coefficients must must vanish and so that the first coefficient vanishes three times baryon chemical potential plus the sum of the left-handed lepton chemical potentials zero this is this is the way we really express this failure on equilibrium. Previously, I said that when sphalerons are equ in equi equilibrium, then the number, number density B plus L is sort of zero. But the proper way, way to express it is, in, is not in terms of the number density. The proper way to express it is in t by saying that the chemical potentials are not independent. You have, instead of having four different chemical potentials for baryons and then for three, three different lepton flavors, you only have three. There's a relation. That's failure on equilibrium. And then there is the other issue, which is that this coefficient also must, must vanish, namely that the sum of the left-handed minus the right-handed lepton chemical potentials is zero. And this one calls chiral equilibrium. That's chiral equilibrium. Now, incidentally, but it would be a longer story, but incidentally, if I had been even bolder, and if I had assigned these separate chemical potentials also in the quark sector, for the left and the right-handed quarks, then I would have gotten more terms. But there would have been terms which would have then also uh, required that the, in the quark sector as well, there is chiral equilibrium. And then we talk not only about, for the quarks, it's not only the weak, gauge fields, which are important for the cardiac equilibrium. In fact, it's even more important that the gluons, the strong fields, they also establish chiral equilibrium. Then we talk about strong spherons. They are like the, like the spherons we had above TC. In QCD, there is no MW, so you are basically in the deconfined phase uh, all the time in, in the early universe. But then there are similar, so to say, similar dynamics, and they establish chiral equilibrium also in the quark sector. Okay, so that's, that's now the claim. And so, so, uh, so what I want to do next, I, I want to show this instability. It's a very, very nice computation. We do it for the, for the uh, abelian case because it's simpler. And also because, yeah, well, because it's simpler. But it's sufficient. It's sufficient in particular to, to show in this chiral uh, equilibrium. So I would now propose that we take already the break of uh, of say 13 minutes and then we start at 9:50 so then we have a bit more time for the second lecture and we can go through this computation in a
leisurely manner. Okay, so let's continue. So, <clears throat> so now I want to discuss this uh, instability and um, do you want to choose? I don't know. Yeah. And and this instability is in in uh, in some contexts uh, called the tachyonic instability. And so what we do is now we, um, okay, we, I mean, we were doing this dimensionally reduced theory, so like Euclidean and static, but now we, we take this additional term that we found, this chern simons term, and we take it Minkowski, and, and we try to look at the dynamics in real time. So I'm, I'm now writing a Minkowski and Lagrangian for this abelian field. But then I add here this term, C. C is this one, of G, G1 squared over 32 pi squared. I, I abbreviate it by C and I, J, K, B, I, F, J, K. Okay, um, now I <coughs> let me write this term in a, in a couple of other ways. So first of all, I mean, F mu nu is anti-symmetric, so I can write it as minus one half, where I, in one of the terms, I only take one of the terms, like D mu, P in U, and the, in the other one, I take both terms. And then here I do the same. Uh, this is also anti-symmetric. This is anti-symmetric and this is anti-symmetric. So I can, I can take one of the terms and I, then I get a factor two minus, minus two C I J K B I uh, D J B K. And I, I put the indices up, up now. I up K up two indices, so no, no change in sign. Okay, now I, <coughs> what I'm aiming at is I want to write down the equations of motion that follow from this Lagrangian. So, so I will do the partial integration here to put the deri derivatives here in the, so to say, in the middle. Partial integration puts it a, a plus, change it to sign, so it's then plus one half. And then this goes in the middle. And, and to keep the, get the indices in a nice way, I actually I renamed, the, for instance here, I renamed the nu to be alpha, and then I have d mu, d nu, eta, alpha, beta, and then that's this nu I re renamed to be beta. And in the other term, the other d, uh, d uh, acts on this index, and this d acts on, on this index after the partial integration, so it's minus, I can say it's minus d alpha d beta after the partial integration. Okay? I mean, I'm doing this very carefully because it's important that the signs are correct, that we get what, what is the correct correct answer. Okay, and now, um, of course, this is a gauge theory, so there is some gauge freedom. So to simplify the thing, things a little bit, I, I take the gauge that I put P0 to P0, the zero component to P0, so that I have only spatial gauge field component. It's, it's a partial gauge fixing. It's convenient because here one sees only the spatial gauge field components in the Chern Simons turn, so Let's also have them here as well. So then I replace the alpha and beta by I 
i and j. Okay. Eta ij minus d i d j. Beta j minus this term. Good. So now I want to uh, I want to get the equation of motion. So Euler Lagrange which means that I I vary with respect to some component for instance bi. Okay. So if I vary or take a derivative of bi, I can take a, I can eliminate this term, but I can also eliminate this term because i and j appear symmetrically. I mean, I could do a partial integration and put all the derivatives here and then rename j to bi. So really, i and j, they are symmetric. So if I take a variation, it cancels the factor one half. So I get, I get the lumbar, the lumbar operator, which maybe I right now explicitly did d squared minus nabla squared, then eta ij, eta ij is, in my metric, this is minus delta ij, minus di dj, acting on bj. That's from the first term. And then there's the second term, and I should vary. And here also I can vary with respect to bi, but I should also vary with to be gay, because of course, of course I could rename k to be i and i to be k. This is anti-symmetric with respect to the exchange of i and k, the Le Levitsivita, but there's a derivative, and so I could do a partial integration and put a derivative on the other term, and so that would compensate for the minus sign. So actually these two appear in the same way. So I, would sh I should get minus four times c times this term without a bi, and I put it on the other side of the equation, so then I get four times c epsilon i j k dj p k. And that, this is now valid for all values of i. Okay, so as usual we then to analyze what's going on, we go to momentum space, but let's go momentum space only in the spatial direction. So this means that I write now my bj, here is a function of t and x, so I write it in momentum space and then the amplitude is a function of time and k minus i k dot x. This I can always do. Furthermore, I will now then rotate my system such that the k points in the third direction. That also simplifies life a little bit. And what then happens after all this is we get a ma matrix equation. For B1, B2, B3. Okay, and let's try to work that out. So the left hand side is fairly simple. I can take um, so the first term it's di diagonal, and so um, and there's a, if I take nabla squared, nabla squared brings down uh, k squared minus k squared because there's an i. So minus nabla squared brings down k squared, and then there is a minus in, in total there's a minus there. So this means that that on the, and that's diagonal. So on the diagonal I have time derivatives minus k squared time derivative minus k squared, time derivative minus k squared, b1, b2, b3. 
that's from the first term. And then from the second term, there are derivatives, but only the third, com only the third there's a dependence only on z. So I get a second derivative only in the 3, 3 here, minus dz squared. But then there's again the i, so it turns into a plus k squared. So in the third component, the k squared cancels. And so the third component actually is also, it's a longitudinal component. Since I've chosen movement in the z direction, then the third component is longitudinal. And so it's no wonder that there will not be any wave motion, the case cancelled. But we, it, yeah. Okay, so now uh, for, for the right hand side, we have to watch out a little bit. And so let me do here kind of a sort of to help get things right. I mean, J, the index J can only be three because that's the only direction in which there is. Uh, dependence on, well, this only depends on z on the third component. So j, j, and j is a derivative, so it can only be three. And the i is, i is what was the free variable. So on the first row, it's i equals one, second i equals two, third i equals three. So now, now we should be able to see what comes out. So if there is a derivative, then it always gives minus i times k, minus i times k. So uh, let me put that in front, minus 4c i k. And then on the first row, we have epsilon 1, 3. So the only possibility is that is 2, that gives something non-zero. But 1, 3, 2 is, uh, is an odd permutation, so it's minus. So I get minus b2. On the second row, I have 2, 3. So that's an even. So 2, 3, 1 gives something. So we get a plus, plus b1. And on the thir third row, we have 3. But j is 3, so 3, 3 is 0. There's nothing on the third row. OK, so now we see that indeed the third component is completely trivial. There's just this, this word b3 is zero, so that, that's a gauge mode. We don't need to worry about it, and it, it decouples from the first and, and second. So that's where the interesting things are going on. And so, so let me rewrite the first and second component. So what I do is I, okay, let me, let me multiply the whole thing by minus, both sides by minus, and then I have dt squared, dt squared, b1, b2, and then I put everything else on the right-hand side. So I multiplied it minus, then there was a plus here, but then I put it on the other side, then it becomes a minus, minus k squared, minus k squared. And since I multiplied with a minus, there is now plus 4c i k, and then there is Left over is then minus b2, so minus b2, so minus 4cik, and then plus b1, so here is then plus v1, 4cik. Okay, good. So now we have a de time derivative on the left-hand side, which is proportional to the unit matrix, and then there is a matrix on the right-hand side. So what do we do? Well, we di diagonalize the matrix. And so that's, that's simple to say and also simple to do. Just uh, uh, subtract eigenvalue, take squared, and then the determinant minus Okay, now there are lots, so there's a minus from the determinant and there's another minus from the minuses here and then there's an i and i, which is the third minus. So in total, it's a minus, minus 16 c squared k squared. That determinant should be zero, which means that k squared plus lambda is plus or minus four times c times k. So lambda is 
the eigenvalues are minus k squared plus minus 4ck. And remember, c is some positive number written there. So let's plot these eigenvalues. I plot the eigenvalues as a function of k. OK, minus k squared always goes down. But the linear term can go up or down. And at small values of k, the linear term is the dominant one. So there's one branch which goes up. And then, however, the minus k squared wins over. So it looks like that. And there's a zero, and the zero is, OK, so here lambda is minus k squared plus 4ck. So this means k times 4c minus k. So the zero is at 4 times c. And then there's the other branch where both terms go, go down. So it's, it's like this. OK, so what do we find? We find a domain. So um, for 0 less than k less than 4 times c, there's one eigenvalue which is positive. Well, maybe I should call this lambda plus is positive. So now we know the eigenvalues, then, I, then we should diagonalize, go to the corresponding directions. Diagonalize matrix. And let's call, well, maybe we call B plus the eigenvector. To lambda plus. And since the, since the left-hand side is anyways uh, proportional to the unit matrix, then uh, you can just diagonalize and nothing happens to the left-hand side. OK, so therefore, this mode now satisfies the equation dt squared b plus is lambda plus b plus, where lambda plus is positive for um, in this domain. So. Well, it's simple to solve. Uh, there are two possible solutions. So as a function of t, some coefficient times plus square root of lambda plus times t, and some other coefficient e to minus square root of lambda plus times t. And what do we see? We see here an exponentially growing mode. It's only there for small values of k, but it is, it is there. And so exponentially, if we had found oscillations, that would be fine. This would be, say that we have, we have a stable state and then we can have oscillations on, on top of this stable state. But when we find an exponentially growing mode, even if it's only for certain momenta, then it still it means that the system is unstable. You, you, if you take those momenta and perturb the system just a little bit, then it goes crazy. And so that's the instability. The system is unstable. And so therefore, the whole assumption which led us to this system, the assumption that we can assign these chemical potentials and we can have this chain simultaneously, this assumption is inconsistent. It's not a stable anymore. OK, so therefore we come back to the um, conclusions that if we, if, this, if we are in an equilibrium situation, then 
quark and lepton chemical potentials are not independent, and we cannot, cannot assign separate chemical potentials to le left and right components of leptons. Okay, so that's, that's really, uh, well, I don't know, to me it's a very nice little computation. Good, so now uh, we still have one topic left, but we do it in a way which is related to, to this in order to, to be somehow not get too uh, diffuse. And, and this topic is then, well, a bit about magnetic fields. So we have discussed now many, well, a few <laughs> consequences of uh, potential phase transitions. So gravitational waves yesterday, baryon asymmetry maybe the first is so far today. And, and, and magnetic fields is also one of the things one always discusses in cosmology because um, the short, some short, well, rough, Rough status is, is like this, that there is the side of observation where, well, since decades people say that there are indications of magnetic fields not only in uh, solar, well, in, in galactic systems, but also in an intergalactic medium. And, and in, in some of the other lectures, this was also briefly mentioned. Now these observations, they are, they are not easy, and so roughly, well, strictly speaking, normally they are upper bounds on the fields. And also I'm certainly not, not an expert on that, so I, I will just say that the observational status is sort of, is, is not, not completely clear, but it's certainly not excluded that it there would be large-scale magnetic fields. And so, so if that's the case, then, then then that's a challenge for theoreticians to, um, to explain or to co consider could, could such field, very long large scale fields beyond galactic scales, could they be produced? So, th so there are many mechanisms that have been proposed. So starting from inflation, something during inflation. We produce many things that we observe during inflation. So minor magnetic fields as well, uh, reheating, Phase transitions then, these are sort of, well, and maybe more, and these are, these are kind of primordial. Well, these are primordial. So the idea that you would really produce magnetic fields or at least some kind of seeds for magnetic fields very early in the universe. Uh, maybe then they are somehow magnified by some astrophysical processes, but at least the seeds would be there. But it also may be, at the end of the day, that it's not really primordial, that some of these fields are just generated in the complicated rotational dynamics of galactic systems or so, or, yeah, galaxy clusters or whatnot. So my, my un understanding would be that it's not, not, not settled, but this doesn't, of course, it doesn't prohibit us from considering whether we might produce fields in some of these uh, epochs. So now for us, the topic of the lectures has been phase transition. So, so the natural thing would be to then consider how we produce magnetic fields in phase transitions. But this is kind of complicated. So actually I will now do, uh, I want to do something similar to what we did here. And, and this can be nicely done in the context of inflation. So I'll show some mechanism from inflation, just as an example. Okay, so from... So, 
So what we do is we consider a field. And this field could be the inflaton field, inflation field. Or in some cases, it's maybe not the inflaton field, but some other field which is also evolving during inflation. But I'll take now a special field, which is um, a pseudoscalar. So, and we call a pseudoscalar field of an axion like And so this means that in the, in the, <coughs> in the Lagrangian, I would, I would add a term. So the nice thing about the axion-like field is that it couples in a way which is reminiscent of the things that we had before. So linear coupling, then there is some coefficient, one, which one usually writes, writes downstairs, so that this has a dimension of mass. And then g1 squared. And now this time it's 64. Pi squared, we will see uh, why one usually chooses it like that. And then f mu nu, f rho sigma, just the same type of term as we saw in the anomaly equation. OK, so suppose we have this type of a term. And so now there is a whole story if, um, why this is considered if phi is the inflaton, this is called, is called natural inflation. And why natural? Well, natural because it turns out that this, well, this is a very special interaction. And this very special interaction guarantees that the potential that the inflaton feels is kind of flat. And if you read about the inflation, in inflation you always need a flat potential. And usually it's a problem that if you introduce interactions, then your potential is not anymore flat. This kind of spoils what you need for inflation. So that's why somebody thinks this is natural, because you, with this interaction you kind of get easily a flat potential. Okay, so what do we want to do with this? So let me now um, remind you of the relation of this to the churn simons number and churn simons density. These are sort of textbook things, so maybe you have seen this in quantum field theory lectures, but just in case. Okay, let me define a, a current, K mu. C, some coefficient C, well, which will turn out to be the same coefficient as it was before, but you could think of this first as some, just some coefficient C. Mu, nu, rho, sigma, uh, B nu, F rho, sigma. And if I write f rho sigma in terms of the derivatives, then this is the same as 2 times c mu nu rho sigma b nu d rho b sigma. Because the other term comes with a minus sign. Oh, sorry. I screwed up something, rho sigma, rho sigma, sigma rho. Um, comes with a minus sign, but the indices are interchanged. And since this is epsilon is anti-symmetric, I can, again, in interchange in these indices. <laughs> Get the same. So what I will do is I take a derivative from here, d mu, k mu. And so the derivative can then act on two different places, either here, or here in the second term. But the second term, it has a double derivative, mu and rho, uh, but this is anti-symmetric, this epsilon. So the second term drops out.
and I only get the first term. And now in the first term, I go back to the F. <laughs> I mean, previously we eliminated from the F one of the terms by the anti-symmetry, but I can also introduce other terms by the anti-symmetry. I can kind of duplicate both of these terms to, to into the F, but then I have to always divide by two. And since there are two terms, I then first I divide by two, I get for one of the terms I get C, and then the other time I get C over two. And so I can write it as mu nu rho sigma F mu nu F rho sigma. Okay, so now what I do is I, now I see that I choose Choosing, choosing C is what we had before, 32 pi squared. We see that, that this term L M. So if I choose this, then C over two is G1 squared over 64 pi squared, and then in the LM I have minus phi dot, dot over F, and then this derivative, which we just computed, d mu k mu. We see this, and we see also that, we see that if we take the zero component, k zero, then the k zero is epsilon zero nu rho sigma. Well, if, if mu is zero, then I can only have here spatial indices i, j, k. And then this is the churn simons density we had before. And the C also matches, it's just the same. Okay, one might worry about the uh, overall plus or minus, but this is too complicated, so let's just assume that it works out. It's NC as one. Good, so what do we do then? What we do then is we, we write the action. We integrate over, over the space of the Lagrangian. And then we have d0 k0 plus di ki. Okay, and now f is a constant, uh, phi is a field. Um, so now it depends, of course, what kind of a field this phi is. But if we are considering inflation, and if this phi is like the inflaton, then this phi is, is to a good approximation, it's constant in space. It is, well, it's like a bit like our, well, it's like our order parameters with the Higgs field also, but it's, it's like constant in space, but it can evolve in time, phi t. It's a function of time. So this means that in the spatial directions, uh, I can do partial integration, and this is a boundary term. The spatial derivative is a boundary term. So this gives nothing. And here I can do partial integration, but now I get something. If I do partial integration, then, then I can move this d0 to here, but there's a minus sign. So I get phi dot over f, and then k0, but k0 was my n. Trent Simons. 
And so what do we find? We find exactly the same type of term that we had when we discussed the instability with the chemical potentials. This the coefficient is different, but that's fine. I mean, there we found an instability with uh, in a certain domain of K, and so this now corresponds to the coefficient. And so again, there is an instability. So same dynamics, different coefficient. If we, if from here we we took the equations of motion, we would find the same instability. Instability again. For momenta k, which are smaller than, and now I should also worry about the signs. Previously, we had our c was positive. Now it's not so clear whether phi dot is positive or negative, but it doesn't matter because the so, so some some number some number times this coefficient. And in principle, this is precisely what one wants. You want to generate large wavelength magnetic fields. Short wavelength fields are not so interesting. Short wavelength fields, there's always lots of things happening at short wavelengths. Some later on when the universe reheats, there are many kinds of particles, there's dissipation. Short wavelengths, they, they go to equilibrium fast. But if you manage to generate these large wavelengths, small momenta, large wavelengths, they are much more difficult to get rid of. And they could be good for these large wavelength magnetic fields. So, so this is nice. I mean, so it, it's at least a demonstration that you can find a simp very simple framework where you very efficiently can generate, in principle, large-scale magnetic fields. So in this case, instability is nice. Previously, it was a catastrophe. Now it's nice. Okay, but it's the same instability. Good. I think that's about what I wanted to say about magnetic fields. And so, um, so what? What then? Well, um, well, are there immediate questions on this? Because it, you know, previously we assumed that the system was in equilibrium, was stable, and then we found an instability, and this is a contradiction. Now we didn't assume anything. We just took a Lagrangian and, and action, and we just computed what is the dynamics. We didn't assume any equilibrium here or anything. This was basically, this is a vacuum consideration. There's even no temperature here. But it just turns out that the equation of motion has the same structure. And so, therefore, we can just solve the equation of motion, and now we find that there is this exponentially growing mode. But now it's not a contradiction. It just says there is this exponentially growing mode. And so that is nice because we <laughs> that's a potential explanation of how you could generate magnetic fields. Now, of course, if it's an exponentially growing mode, then you have to, well, it's nice, okay, at first sight. Then you have to start wondering because at some point if you generate lots of fields, then you also put lots of energy in those fields, and there's only so much energy in the system, so there must be some kind of back reactions or whatnot which stop this growth. And this is what people discuss then very much. But at least there are, there's something, some kind of seeds for, for this structure. Okay, good. So, so the very last thing I wanted to mention then is uh, is some, some hints about li literature. And, uh, okay, um, sort of, um, there's, there are some lecture notes on thermal field theory. and also some applications to cosmology and also some other applications. And this, uh, there are also some of the things we have discussed, like some issues about phase transitions and nucleations are, can be found here. So these are 
notes by myself and Alexi Vuorinen, and it's 1701 uh, and something. You can, you can find the something from the Inspire. Then there are lecture notes on, on phase transitions. and gravitational waves. And also some, some, some more about simulations than we had, but, but mostly these are also th theoretical notes. These are by Mark Hindmarsh. And, and some others, and this is 2020 August, and then some number. Okay, then for baryon asymmetry, now there are many mechanisms there. I mean, the phase transition is one, but that there are other mechanisms as well. But there is a review which covers also the phase transitions. This is by Dietrich Bödecker and Wilfried Buchmüller. And that is sort of almost simultaneous. Okay, so for somehow, yeah, yeah. Well, these are I think the most important that I can now think of. And then, uh, then also I should say one more thing is, which is that my notes, um, notes for these lectures. Well, of course, they are at the at the um, at the web pages. But I, during the week, I made some minor fixes here and there, and so I think on on Monday I'll rescan my my notes. So if you want to have the very latest version, you can find them at at my homepage. There's already the current version, but then there will be an update on Monday. Okay, good. Well, we are early, but it's been a long week, so maybe it's a good time to stop. Well, thanks a lot for your attention even today.